Thank you. It's a, it's, thank, thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's a pleasure being here and finally uh, having the privilege to um, meet uh, Professor Alan Wolf, whose work I've um, admired and learned from over the years, and to um, encounter the um, good folks at the Boise Center and um, and uh, to be to be back in in in, in Boston. Um, it's such a beautiful afternoon outside. You're courageous to come in and, and give up the remaining sunlight. There will be no more sunlight until June of 2016. Um, but uh, in any case, it's, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I spent um, much of the morning at a wonderful cafe in Brookline, great coffee shop, like the Four Something. Does anybody know that coffee shop? Awesome. Right across from the, um, from the Israel bookstore. You know that bookstore? Anyway, um, I was um, on such an amazing caffeine buzz and having such a wonderful time in the sunlight that I rewrote a lot of this lecture. It's not going to be any longer than 50 minutes, I promise, um, or I, 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 I hope um, <laughs> will be the case, and uh, probably don't hope as much as you do. Um, but I will be kind of looking around at a very complicated series of notes that I've made to myself <laughs> as, we, as we journey together through what I um, hope you um, will find to be um, a fascinating year in the life of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, in his journey from um, a child, a golden child of the, of the German Bildungsbürgertum, the upper educated middle class of the neighborhood um, of um, intellectuals, artists, industrialists called the Berlin Grunewald um, to a um, member of the German co conspiracy who prayed for the defeat of his country and who blessed the work of conspirators in their plot to assassinate Hitler. There, there was a time, uh, just to get things started, uh, in American public life uh, when theologians and scholars of religion took part in the critical issues of the day. Um, their articles and books were published by major newspapers, by uh, political journals and uh, magazines. Their, their books were often commissioned by major trade presses and, um, and, and sold um, not only in sort of niche academic markets or religious markets, but, uh, but, but promoted through the major journals of the, of the day. Um, those years uh, appear to be over, do they not? And um, I think of um, some of us, you know, uh, long for those um, golden years of the, of the public theologian. Not, not everyone misses them. I, one of my former teachers, Richard Rorty, uh, in a response to a, a fairly complicated and esoteric lecture on postmodern uh, theory and religion, uh, said and ended up writing uh, that uh, I just keep hoping that theologians will all go away. <laughs> and, uh, and, but and this is not to say that theology as a discipline has um, become obsolete. I met this afternoon with brilliant young theologians. The, 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 the applications are up. The guild is thriving. This university has just sent a very talented young theologian to join uh, uh, us at, at UVA in the, uh, the R Religious Studies Department, Nicole Flores, if any of you know her. Still, the public theologian has become um, a rare bird. And in any case, the sound bites of the religious celebrities are preferred by, by the right and by the left, I should add, to the ruminations of the teachers who insist on slowing down speech <laughs> on delineating nuance, on drawing from ancient historical sources, and exercising a certain reticence when necessary. The forecast, in any case, for a secular America made amidst the social crisis of the late 1960s did not play out to script. In fact, I would suggest that theology matters now more than ever 
And it will not do to wish that we all go away, even though I often wish that as a theologian in the guild, as inevitable or desirable, I should say, as that may be to some. As I have made my uh, way uh, from a childhood a long way away from the Berlin Grunewald in the segregated South, the child of a, a Southern Baptist minister who came of age during the most violent years of uh, white Christian terrorism uh, in the 1960s, I have found as I have tried to make sense of haunting uh, memories that have formed um, that have formed haunting, equally haunting theological questions, that the most compelling answers have often come when I cleave to the stories of people whose lives illuminated hope and authenticity, who um, performed theology in vital and, um, and meaningfully uh, concrete ways, and whose lives were devoted to humanity and to life. Uh, if we had the rest of the evening, I would tell you stories about some of these um, patron, matron saints of mine, Miss Fanny Lou Hamer of Ruleville, Mississippi, Clarence Jordan, Victoria Gray Adams, John Lewis, Casey Hayden, Will D. Campbell, whiskey drinking, tobacco chewing Baptist preacher who passed away last year. Ella Baker, one of my heroes is standing, sitting in this audience today, surprised me. Russell Zhang from Oakland, uh, about whom I wrote a, a short section in the beloved community. Uh, brilliant organizer um, out of a, a, a community uh, called the Oak Park community. And American religious dissidents of the generation preceding the civil rights movement, some of whom you will uh, meet presently. But always, and always, my thoughts have returned to the life and legacy of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the Berlin pastor and theologian executed by the Nazis on April 9th, 1945, in the Flossenburg concentration camp, whose robust Christian humanism, uh, and one might say fierce uh, devotion to the teachings of Jesus, his commitment to live in truth inspires me to, to, to think of him and to offer him today to us as a theologian for our time. And in my, in my talk this afternoon, this evening, these two worlds will in fact cross paths in surprising and I think intriguing, hopefully inspiring ways. The, um, the story of Bonhoeffer's journey to reality, as one of his um, relatives uh, later uh, described the narrative arc of his life, and the radical prophets and, 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 um, and activists um, who um, scholars have learned only recently uh, framed his American year as one of profound growth and imaginative renewal. So please join me on this journey as we revisit tonight Bonhoeffer's life and legacy in the context of his first uh, and his longest trip to the United States, 1930-1931. Um, in the summer of 1930, let's get going, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to New York City and to Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan as a visiting student and postdoctoral fellow. When he arrived, he was a straight arrow academic whose star was rising. He was a 24-year-old privat docent, assistant professor at the University of Berlin, the most important and famous of the theology faculties in Germany. His sights were set on a lifetime of intellectual leisure and the rewards of the academic guild. His doctoral dissertation, completed years earlier at the um, age of 21, had been praised by the great Karl Barth as eine theologische Überraschung, a theological uh, 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 miracle or surprise, depending on um, the tone. And he had recently completed his second dissertation 
uh, his Habilitations de Schrift, which is the second dissertation required to be promoted in German academe, uh, called Act and Being, which was a conceptually dazzling and uh, exceedingly ambitious attempt uh, to completely overhaul the uh, German philosophical tradition as it moved from Kantian subjectivity through um, Husserl and Heidegger. All of that is to say a lack of self-confidence was not or then or ever a problem for Bonhoeffer. But when he left New York 10 months later, he did so with a profoundly transformed um, perspective on social engagement, on historical responsibility, and on the, pos uh, the possibilities of the theological vocation and the life of faith. A technical terminology that had defined his writings prior to 1930 would, would give way to a language more direct and expressive of lived faith um, um, that, uh, that was animated by, by what he often um, spoke of as the effort to see clearly in the anxious middle. In, in Tegel Prison in, in 1944, where he would be incarcerated for uh, numerous um, charges related to his role in the conspiracy against Hitler, Bonhoeffer recalled this um, first American experience in a letter to his dear friend Eberhard. And he said, there have been only two times in my life when I can observe profound personal growth and transformation. One was under the strong impression of my father. His father was the director of the Center for Nervous Diseases and Psychiatry at the University of Berlin. The second was on my first journeys abroad. And he spoke not uh, of, of, of his time in Italy and North Africa, of, of, of Spain, and, and more than anything else of this year in America. And he said, it was then that I began to make, and I love this, I love this uh, phrase, uh, the turning from the phraseological to the real. Baker, Eberhard Baker, uh, who, the author of the magisterial biography, biography uh, weighs in at about 1,200 pages, uh, 700 pages longer than Strange Glory, <laughs> um, wrote in a very short section on the American experience, something happened. Didn't really tell us what it was. What I'd like to ask tonight is, what happened? And I'd like to explore this, this question, what happened, in the context of three prophetic encounters during this year. The first is Bonhoeffer's encounter with what we might call the, Ameri the tradition of American social theology. The second with the African American church and, uh, and, uh, and black culture. And the third with what we might call the American organizing tradition. Let's take, before we jump in, a brief inventory, okay, of Bonhoeffer's life on the eve of his first visit to America. Looking at his notes and his letters, as I was able to do in the beautiful Staatsbibliothek where Alan may have worked some years ago in Berlin, you might draw the conclusion that he expected the year in America to be another chapter in his charmed life. He certainly did not think he had anything to learn theologically in the new world. He regarded American um, theology as nothing more than um, William James's pragmatism kind of applied to Protestant congregational life, and maybe he was right about that. The scholar Clifford Green, who lives and works here in Boston, if you indulge me one kind of pedantic moment here, draws our attention in trying to answer this question to an intriguing passage that we find in Bonhoeffer's second theological examination at Berlin before he came to the United States. The examination had asked him to find interesting scriptural passages for a Bible series, a series of preaching on God's path through history in the church. And Bonhoeffer turned his attention and found um, quite revelatory those first few verses 
of the epistle of Hebrews, which describe the great story of faith and culminates the saga of faith from creation to the first martyrs in chapter 11 um, uh, with this verse, therefore, you know this verse, since we are um, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Certainly this verse would come to have great importance to Bonhoeffer as the American year unfolded. And he would write to a good friend in Berlin five months into his year that as he experienced a new country, a, an unfamiliar culture, the strange and to him altogether exotic, bewildering kind of religious landscapes of America, that he realized that he was searching for a cloud of witnesses. In the 12 courses Bonhoeffer took as a Sloan Fellow at Union, he focused on philosophy of religion, theology, and social ethics. But the subject, while the subject matter was familiar, the institutional context was altogether unlike anything he was accustomed to in Berlin. And he was decidedly underwhelmed. What was he to make of a religious culture in which he said people fashion their ideas of God the same way a man might order a car from the factory in Detroit? The students, he, would, he said, more to the point of his observations, the students here, on average, 25 to 30 years old, are totally clueless. They are not familiar with even the most basic questions of Christian dogmatics. They can become easily intoxicated with liberal and humanistic phrases. They talk a blue streak, but often without the slightest substantive foundation. Railing against the Christian fundamentalists, he said, seemed to be the Union student's favorite pastime, Bonhoeffer said, and yet basically, most of the students I've observed here are not even up to the level of the Christian fundamentalist. Everyone just blabs away so frightfully, he noted, there is no theology in America. <laughs> he noted with astonishment that he occasionally heard students, seminarians preparing for the Protestant ministry, ask whether really one must preach about Christ in order <laughs> to be a minister. Bonhoeffer noted, it has come to this, that this Protestant seminary has forgotten what the Christian faith in its very essence stands for. He felt that this was more broadly true of American Protestant culture and the whole franchise of liberal Protestantism as a whole. The principle, um, the principle doctrines of Christian dogmatics are in utter disarray. And in America, it would appear that it's possible to enter the ministry without having a clue of what one thinks about God. This is Bonhoeffer's first observation. And yet, amidst all this sort of theatrical hand-wringing and, and I think um, the drama that is sort of part of his personality, I don't want us and I don't want you to lose sight of an important fact that prior to coming to America in, in Berlin, Bonhoeffer had fallen into a melancholy state in his academic life. His best friend at the time, Franz Hildebrand, assured Bonhoeffer with a kind of homegrown irreverence that there's nothing better to report about Berlin than what you're reporting in America. And Hildebrand went on to recount how um, one markedly inferior professor named uh, Professor Schwebel had recently treated the students to a completely muddled and annoying discourse on the merits of the Hohenzollern dynasty and on the spirit of obedience in faith and of the discipline of patriotism. Bonhoeffer had written in his notebooks prior to his journey to America, the air is closed and stuffy in Berlin. You look at his notebooks and it's like he's having a sense of claustrophobia and that the air has grown thin. And moreover, as a post 
um, as a post-doctoral graduate student teaching fellow, teaching um, in the theology department, he, um, his life really amounted to little more than, as he said, grading excruciatingly dumb research papers. Um, such observations uh, fueled uh, throughout his life Bonhoeffer's <laughs> frequent desire to run away. And you see in his character, I think, a, a profound restlessness. And he, he, he might have gone back to Italy, where he spent a wonderful six weeks, um, completely enchanted by Italian Catholicism during Holy Season. He might have gone back to Spain or to Northern Africa. He might have gone to India or to Palestine as it was his life's hope to do. Everything here in Germany seems so infinitely banal and dull. I have never noticed what nonsense people speak and the trams on the street, it's just shocking. All of this is to say Bonhoeffer's critical agitated remarks suggest that he had grown impatient with what he found constraining not only in the life of academic um, uh, and intellectual um, work, but um, that, um, that the kind of a feeling of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the malaise in Germany had reached a, a kind of uh, um, innervating, had become a kind of innervating weight. Um, and so he came to America. <laughs> American social theology. In the fall of 1930, as many of you will know, Union Theological Seminary in New York was the flagship institution of Protestant liberal thought in North America. The student body in 1930 was more diverse than it had ever been, and um, uh, it included African Americans, Asian Americans, women, and, uh, and poor whites from uh, the urban north and the rural south. Among a faculty of nearly 40, no one represented the uniqueness and the, and the, the vibrancy of progressive Protestant uh, thought uh, more than the indefatigable Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, still only two years away from his pastorate in inner city Detroit. Reinhold Niebuhr, the great dramatist of uh, theological ideas in the public square for whom probing analysis of the contemporary political and social situation was as important as, if not more so, than parsing sacred doctrine for whom concrete engagement in the social order was a foremost um, uh, responsibility for the person of faith. Bonhoeffer had never seen anyone like him. In the concept of Christian realism, which Niebuhr was working out in his seminars and lectures during that very year, 1930-31, and which would um, set the, 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 the sort of the thematic uh, framework uh, for um, Niebuhr's landmark work, A Moral Man and Immoral Society, that was published uh, in 1932, Niebuhr spoke the sobering truth that there will never be any final escape in historic existence from the contradictions in which human nature is involved. Niebuhr's honest assessments of power and justice would strike a chord with people of faith and people throughout um, American public life searching uh, for a, a way beyond uh, liberal idealism and Victorian quietism. By the time, um, um, so let, let, let me just say one, one, other, one quick thing about, about Niebuhr. Uh, Niebuhr was at his best when analyzing the structures and the behavior of political systems and offering theological interpretations of events as a basis for common action for a wide audience. He was one of the great public theologians of the day. And aspiring to greater public relevance, Niebuhr tended to communicate his ideas in a manner that left his theological commitments unspoken. 
the public theologian, he understood, would inevitably be misunderstood at times, as would demurrals on doctrine's finer points. But Niebuhr resolved nonetheless to be a circuit writer in defense of the Christian faith in a secular age, while also making common cause with progressives in responsible action throughout um, the various fields of uh, social and political engagement. In an interesting autobiographical essay, Niebuhr would say, you know, I've never been very competent in the nice points of pure theology. And I must confess that I have not been sufficiently interested heretofore to acquire the confidence. <laughs> Bonhoeffer took um, courses with Niebuhr in both semesters. And while he found the courses intriguing, uh, particularly Niebuhr's ethical viewpoints in modern literature that introduced Bonhoeffer to the writings of James Weldon Johnson and W.E.B. Du Bois, Bonhoeffer found Niebuhr's views positively bewildering. One day after class in the first um, semester, Bonhoeffer um, went um, forth uh, directly to um, speak with the professor and he asked, is this a seminary or is it a training center for politicians and activists? And he did not mean that as a compliment. Niebuhr might have taken it as one. But Niebuhr was equally perplexed by the erudite uh, and su supremely confident Lutheran from Berlin. And as you know, Reinhold Niebuhr was not one to shy away from a good debate. When Bonhoeffer asserted in a term paper he wrote for Niebuhr in that first fall that the god of guidance could be known only from the god of justification, Niebuhr responded sharply, your doctrine of justification, I know that it's very Lutheran, but it has no ethical dimension. It is overly abstract. He wrote in the margin, there is no ethical uh, uh, dimension in your notion of justification. It has no bearing on the concrete here and now. And Niebuhr pushed Bonhoeffer to think more realistically about the ethical content and significance of this God of justification. In making grace as transcendent as you do, Niebuhr said, I don't see how you can ascribe any ethical significance to it. Bonhoeffer would never acknowledge a, um, a, a clear or specific theological debt to Reinhold Niebuhr. He, uh, he worries that Niebuhr's theology lacked confessional richness. Um, and these worries were, were basic and I think well-founded. The two, however, would stay in touch over the next decade. Bonhoeffer often wrote uh, as the uh, church struggle, the Kirchenkampf and the, and the conspiracy took shape to Niebuhr in German, and which Niebuhr wet, read well and spoke fluently, though he replied to Bonhoeffer in English. When in the summer of 1939, Bonhoeffer found himself at a fateful crossroad, Niebuhr would offer him refuge in New York and hastily put together uh, a professorship or a series of, of positions that would have given Bonhoeffer a, um, a, a way of, of, um, of living um, safely apart from um, the great masquerade of evil that was unfolding in Germany. And yet, I think that it's correct to say that Bonhoeffer was fundamentally transformed by what we might call the spirit of Niebuhr's public theology and by um, the exemplification of a theologian who engaged the social order with civil courage and ultimate honesty, two Niebuhrian terms which would become um, terms in, in Bonhoeffer's ethics and, and um, later writings, who insisted that the enterprise of theology engage the um, concrete concerns of, of, the, of the present era. I think, for example, when you hear Bonhoeffer use the phrase costly discipleship in what's probably his best known 
uh, book outside of academic audiences, The Cost of Discipleship, you are hearing echoes of Niebuhr's margin comments in his union paper, your doctrine of justification does not have an ethical consequence. And Bonhoeffer would write in the very first pages of, of Cost of Discipleship, justification without obedience is cheap grace. Costly grace is understanding that justification and that the grace of God is a grace that forms and compels new patterns of life and ethical um, behavior. You know, I just last week discovered um, one other amazing point. It kind of blew me away. I wish I had had it for the biography. That when Bonhoeffer launched in a, in a, what would become an, an illegal seminary in 1935 to, uh, in this beautiful um, sort of a state in northeast Germany in the Pomeranian region that served for two years to train pastors who were going into the Bekennende Kirche, the Confessing Church, which, which was a small part of the uh, Lutheran Church that was seeking to carve out a non-Nazi, anti-Nazi space. Bonhoeffer said, what we shall need now, and he was writing to his brother Karl Friedrich, who was an atheist. The, the Bonhoeffer family was kind of who was all mainly you know, robust humanist and not particularly religious, were quite um, concerned about their, their brother or son, Dietrich, who was showing every sign of being a bit of a zealot <laughs> as a pastor. And Bonhoeffer's writing his brother, an atheist, to say, I know this seems weird to you. It seems a little zealous. But this is the path that, for me, is the path to reality, the path to full humanness. And we, I, I think that the only way to blow up this great evil system is by taking the Sermon on the Mount with absolute seriousness. And it's by developing in small groups of communities of radical Christians a new form of monasticism. Well, I found a letter from Reinhold Niebuhr written three years earlier in which um, he said precisely is a new kind of monasticism. So, sorry for that digression. The African American uh, church and culture. Before his arrival in New York, this is the second point, we're moving along here. Um, before his arrival in, in, in New York from Germany, Bonhoeffer had never had a conversation with a person of color. Once on uh, a 10-day excursion to Libya in the spring of 1924, he and his brother Klaus had gone to Italy uh, for a long spring break and then, um, without telling the parents, jumped on a, a, a freighter down to North Africa and wandered around Libya for 10 days. He had noted in his journal that the Arabs, Bedouins, and Negroes sitting on donkeys in great picturesque white cloaks traversing the streets of Tripoli and a colorful throng of peculiar figures. And prior to 1930, that's about the only <laughs> reference to race you find in his writings. His teachers at Union introduced him to what the uh, Swedish sociologist Gunnar Meidel would, call, would later call the American dilemma via readings from Du Bois, uh, Johnson, and the rest. Still, it was not until a seminarian named Franklin Fisher, sought him out that Bonhoeffer came to know an African American. And it was not until this black seminarian at Union invited Bonhoeffer to join him for a Sunday morning church service in Harlem that the German visitor had any experience of American preaching and worship that seemed to him vital and authentic. The first time he worshiped with black Christians was, in fact, a revelation. Frank Fisher, the son of ACL Fisher, pastor of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and a graduate of Howard College, uh, now Howard University, had come to New York not only for the unique opportunities Union offered African American seminarians, but also to learn more about the Harlem Renaissance, then in full flower. 
Assigned to the Abyssinian Baptist Church as a pastoral intern, Fisher would, with a gentle kindness, guide this stranger in a world foreign to most Americans, let alone Europeans. And Bonhoeffer was more than pleased to discover a tradition that, as he would write in his notes, stood fairly untouched, indeed avoided, by the white church. And this marked the beginning of an intense five-month immersion in the black churches of America. Bonhoeffer would write to his family, for my friendship with this Negro student, I've come, uh, I, I'm meeting every week with a group of boys and also visit them in their home of what he understood as one of my most important experiences in America. In fact, he would begin teaching a children's Bible study, uh, a, a, a Bible study for women in the church, and on one occasion, the um, great Adam Clayton Powell Sr. invited Bonhoeffer to preach, and uh, he um, yielded the pulpit, which is a remarkable compliment to this young German. Alas, the transcript of that sermon is somewhere in the dustbins of history. I spent a lot of time looking for it. Um, he knew, Bonhoeffer uh, did, that, that, that uh, the access he enjoyed to the African American church was rare, but at the same time, the results of such an experience are, I must say, um, also deeply distressing. He said it was to see the real face of America, something that is hidden behind the veil of words in the American Constitution, that all men are created free and equal. The image of the veil, some of you will know, it is worth noting, Bonhoeffer borrowed from Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk, a book he had been assigned to read in Niebuhr's class. It was not only the exuberance and the felt worship and what Bonhoeffer called the eruptive and sorrowful joy of black church that excited him, but the seriousness of black intellectual life as well. Among his white Northeastern classmates, Bonhoeffer said he often had the sense that he was talking with schoolboys. But his conversations with Frank Fisher and with other Negroes and East Asian students, though in one way entirely new, were in another profound sense reminiscent of exchanges in Berlin Grunewald, the ideas percolating with intensity, with concentration, with, with verve. The, Bonhoeffer said the reigning atmosphere of white Protestant culture in America produces inordinate confusion and lack of clarity, and it always leaves me feeling depressed. But my Negro friends proved to me, proved to be never for a moment boring. It really does seem to me that there's a great movement forming. And I do believe that the Negroes in America will still give the whites here considerably more than merely their folk songs. <clears throat> One classmate, Miles Horton, founder of the Highlander Folk School, some of you may know that school, it became a great training center for labor activists and civil rights organizers in Mont Eagle, Tennessee. A seminary in Bonhoeffer could never have imagined before coming to New York. Uh, poor white um, from, uh, from Eastern Appalachia who grew up in, in situations you know, that, um, that were you know, unforgivably marked by um, James Agee and Walker Evans and Let Us Now praise, praise famous men who would later write in a memoir, a great memoir called The Long Haul, that the only reason he, had ever, he ever got accepted to Union is because the seminary was looking for a token hillbilly. Um, Miles Horton recalled an exchange that he had with Dietrich on a Sunday morning after he had just returned from morning services at Abyssinian. He said, Bonhoeffer was talkative and excited, and I, I, I'd never seen him quite like that, and instead of going to his room, where he usually preferred to go, he asked me to take a walk 
um, down Riverside Drive and, and describe the preaching with excitement, sometimes speaking German, <laughs> Uh, and audience participation, and especially the singing of the spirituals. He was very emotional and did not try to hide his feelings. It thrilled him to hear the church people respond to the sermon with punctuating amens and hallelujahs. He said it was the only time he had experienced true religion in the United States. And he was convinced that it was only among this particular counterculture that there might be any real religion, any authentic Christianity in the United States. One more point on this, and then we'll turn to the final section. Not to be overlooked is that this year of Bonhoeffer's immersion at Abyssinian also marked an important um, a year of, of growth and change in the life of the distinguished senior pastor, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, senior. When I was doing research at the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin, it moved me um, greatly to open up um, one of these newly obtained uh, boxes of archival documents that had been given to the city library by, um, by family. And to see that this box labeled America had an enormous file of clippings on all aspects of American race relations, of lynchings, NAACP reports, and, um, um, and particularly of, of black sermons and the black homile homiletical tradition. And it included a small little um, uh, unpublished memoir by Adam Clayton Powell Sr. called Upon This Rock. It'd be great if someone would would, would re reprint that. Uh, Powell had been the senior pastor of this historic church since 1908, eloquent uh, uh, speaker and skilled administrator. But as the Great Depression swept over his Harlem parish, he was inspired to a new self-understanding as a pastor and a citizen. In this short book, Upon This Rock, Powell said that he began to think differently about Jesus. And he said, I began to imagine Jesus no longer, this is his phrase, as, a, as, a, as only a transcendent reality, powerful but inaccessible. But as, but as one who wandered the streets of Harlem, homeless and poor, who shared the struggles of the distressed as friend and counselor. Three years later, Bonhoeffer's last lectures at at U University of Berlin before he lost his teaching position because of the Nazification of the faculties. In lectures about the doctrine of Christ, he would, he would, he would propose a notion called the Christological incognito. The idea that the presence of Christ is found in places of exclusion and distress, in places that subvert our you know, prevailing notions of deity and of divine power. And I think that he was um, speaking directly from his, um, his months of listening to, to Powell preach. OK, so I have to say this before we turn to the third point. And maybe you can ask me about this in Q&A. But the spring of that year, in April 1931, Bonhoeffer decided that he didn't want to go back to Germany early. Um, the semester ended at the, um, at the end of, of, of April, that he wanted to see America. So with um, a fellow, um, two fellow Europeans, both of whom had been uh, visiting uh, students that year, Erwin Sutz, a, a Swiss, and Jean Lesser, a Frenchman, he um, borrowed an old car and um, passed his driver's exam uh, it took him four times, but he finally passed his driving exam. Apparently, he bribed the New York City driver instructor with a $5 bill and finally passed to take a road trip and across country. And in six weeks, um, the, 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 the trio and finally ended up being only Bonhoeffer and the Frenchman logged 4,000 miles driving and another 1,200 miles on Mexican trains. And coming back from um, Mexico in New Orleans, instead of going north to Chicago and back 
to um, New York the way they had come. Bonhoeffer said, let's go due east. And the two Europeans took their car uh, straight into the heart of the Jim Crow South, driving from New Orleans along old Highway 10 through Hattiesburg, Laurel, Meridian, Mississippi, through um, uh, Demopolis, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, they would have driven 20 miles from a town called Scottsboro that that very month was bringing to trial the, um, uh, the Scottsboro boy case in a trial that electrified um, uh, liberals and progressives and as I was reading most recently, um, served as a great recruiting boon to the Alabama Communist Party, um, which is like reading, you know, a, a story about some, it's a, almost a fantasy tale, but it's an extraordinary um, um, moment in, um, in American and international, it's covered by all the international papers, and Bonhoeffer returned to New York, and before he um, left for Germany, he penned a little meditation using a poem he had, he had been assigned um, that year by a Harlem Renaissance poet, County Cullen, called The Black Christ. Bonhoeffer comments on this black Christ who is being led into the field by all the white Christ. And he refers to, to Cullen's poem and the, the, this, this astonishing conclusion that as a lynching unfolds in a southern field, this, uh, an African American who has, who, has, who has brought to this brutal death by a lynch mob of white church people in his death and in his suffering becomes the anointed one, Bonhoeffer said, becomes the black. Christ. Finally, the American organizing tradition, the third and last prophetic encounter of Bonhoeffer's year in America. In the remaining months of the spring semester, Bonhoeffer found his way into one other vibrant counterculture in progressive religious circles. Decades on, in 1976, the physicist Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker would present a paper at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Congress in Geneva, commemorating the 70th anniversary of his birth, describing the pastor's life as, quote, a journey to reality. If Bonhoeffer had remained an academic theologian, Weizsäcker wrote, it seems to me that he would not have been able to resolve the problems he dealt with. In response to historical necessity, he freely chose a path that is more real that path on which he first embarked during this American year, passed through not only the black church and the politically charged classrooms at Union, but also finally into circles of American activist um, for, uh, 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 um, energies, or, or to what um, 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 my former teacher, Richard Rorty, spoke of as the, the old, the old reformist left. So that by the end uh, of the year, the real, the real, had achieved almost the status of, of a sacrament. It was among Union's faculty and students that Bonhoeffer first encountered that the scholarly activist cohort. Through, through these associations, he would visit the tenement ministries of New York, engage with the Women's Trade Union and the Workers' Educational Bureau of America, taking notes on the labor movement, poverty, homelessness, crime, and the social mission of the churches. He met with officials at the American Civil Liberties Union, which after its founding in 1920, had focused mainly on the rights of uh, conscientious objectors and um, on the problem of uh, resident aliens, uh, protecting resident aliens from deportation. He would write to his brother, Carl Friedrich, that we will need an ACLU in Germany. All had connections with religious thinkers. Reinhold Niebuhr foremost, he's everywhere in this story. 
since his arrival at Union, uh, just to bring this point home one final time, in 1928, a cadre of social reformers had turned to Niebuhr for moral and financial support, which time and again he had provided generously. Without his inspiration and his practical assistance, these movements might not have existed or succeeded to the extent that they did. Niebuhr's encouragement, as well as his concrete help, he was a very skilled fundraiser and organizer, um, are evident throughout the letters and exchanges with members of groups dating to this remarkably fertile period of American social theology. Most of these men and women of the American organizing tradition, the ones Bonhoeffer met both at Union and in his travels, were earnestly seeking the building of the kingdom of God on earth, and thus were working in some fashion in the spirit of the social gospel movement. And while these champions of the social gospel hardly had time to sift through the implications of Niebuhr's emerging Christian realism, um, uh, if they had they, they would have understood that he um, had moved beyond um, such um, liberal hopes and uh, aspirations and uh, such utopian visions. I think it speaks to, to, to Niebuhr's sensitivities and wisdom and his, his kindness that even as he rejected as naive optimism many of the suppositions of the social gospel, that the age of perpetual peace and that the kingdom of God were coming in full through our labors in the community, in the fields, in the, in the cities, Niebuhr still embraced the social gospel movement's transformative energies and never discouraged idealism among the grassroots, um, admiring the intent of these visionaries, if not their own understanding. Bonhoeffer's personal knowledge of the American organizing tradition, however, came more directly through two largely forgotten teachers at Union, one Harry Ward and one Charles Weber. And it also deepened in friendships with classmates whose social imaginations had been excited by the emerging, uh, this, this emerging vision of beloved community. Let me say a word about um, Charles Weber. A Methodist minister, professor of practical theology, and radical socialist, Weber hailed from a small town in Michigan he would become known to friends and foes alike as the chaplain of American organized labor. His, theor his, his book titled, um, don't all run out and buy it, A History of the Development of Social Education in the United Neighborhood Houses of New York City, though unlikely summer reading, was devoured by Bonhoeffer in New York. Weber was himself a skilled and tenacious organizer. His involvements were extensive. In the 1930s, he held leadership positions in the Industrial um, Fellowship of, of Reconciliation, the Upper Mississippi Waterway Association, and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, based in Richmond, Virginia. Weber's course that Bonhoeffer took, called Church and Community, um, resembled what we often call today a service learning initiative, but it was much more than that. Bonhoeffer could not believe his eyes when he saw his professor um, convening the students in the quadrangle at Union and going with them out into um, a city um, that was uh, that was teeming with uh, an exquisite variety of lived theologies, innovations in congregational organizing. Um, and his uh, subject was life, this Professor Weber. Theology and practice, Bonhoeffer and his classmates ventured out from the, from the classroom into a metropolis abounding with innovations in faith-based organizing. Bonhoeffer would write, in connection with a course of Mr. Weber's, I paid a visit almost every week 
to one of these character building agencies. We went to settlements, to the YMCA, home missions, cooperative houses, playgrounds, children's courts, night schools, socialist schools, asylums, youth organizations. We visited members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. That a professor would lead such efforts was nothing short of astounding to one accustomed to, to, to professors at Berlin uh, bunkered down in their offices in the theology faculty uh, near the Hegelplatz. Bonhoeffer would get deep into the weeds, visiting the National Women's Trade Union and the Workers' Educational Bureau of America, studying labor problems, selective buying campaigns, civil rights, restriction of profits, juvenile delinquency, and the activity of the churches in these fields. In proposing solutions, Weber drew on models and insights gleaned from the Southern Tenants Farm Workers Union, the Delta Cooperative, and the British Cooperative Movement, with whom he personally had worked. He introduced students to officials, as I said, from the ACLU and to other radical organizations. These were transformative encounters. Before that year, Bonhoeffer had rarely discussed politics. And when he had, it was mostly in response to his brothers, radicalized by the Great War, who never missed an opportunity to butt heads concerning the finer, uh, finer points of the Weimar government or the morality of its democratic reforms. Bonhoeffer's friend Helmut Rusler had once complained of Bonhoeffer's inclination to escape into the, the ethereal world of comprehensive ideas and thus avoid the muck, the murk and mist of boiling hot politics. Indeed, there is not even mention in Bonhoeffer's notes or letters of what was the lead item in the New York Times the day of his arrival. Fascists make big gains in Germany. But as it turns out, his querulous suspicion of God-deprived, theology-deprived Union Seminary softened in the course of his interactions with, as he would put it, the contemporary representatives of the social gospel. He would come to regard the sobriety and the seriousness of this generation as irrefutable, as well as determinative for me for a long time to come. And he would never drop his charge that Reformation Christianity already included the same concerns without repudiating historic theology, which repudiation he would continue to regard as un, um, undermining the social gospel position. Yet his signal transformation in the course of that year, when he accomplished as he would later say, or when he began, as he later would say, to make the turning from the phraseological to the real, would always be linked by what he saw at Union, both inside the classroom and out. There would be, for Bonhoeffer, no longer an escape from this awareness. Something was missing from German theology as Bonhoeffer's cousin Hans Christoph von Haas would later put it. The grounding of theology in reality. And in America, Bonhoeffer found that grounding. Back in Berlin, and we're almost finished. Thanks for hanging with me. He moved into the neighborhood near Zionskirche in Prinzlauer Berg, teeming with unemployment and massive social unrest, the result of um, layoffs from factories and industry in the area. He moved because he wanted to work in an inner city ministry and would eventually have several hundred coffermans um, under his care. 
he said he fell in love with the Bible. He said, I don't want to call myself a theologian anymore, but a Christian. He said, I, um, I became obsessive about the Sermon on the Mount. And indeed, these teachings um, would become obsessive in Bonhoeffer's theological imagination in the coming years. He was drawn into an intimate reading of Jesus' teachings and at the same time affirmed the importance of Christianity's rootedness in Judaism and the Hebrew Bible. He moved now in response to a new understanding of faith. And as we know, he would only come to speak more passionately of communities of obedience and of prayer, of spiritual disciplines that would bring purification, clarification, and concentration upon the essential thing and of responsible action in the world come of age. It is the problem of concreteness that preoccupies, preoccupies me now, he wrote. And this from the same young, young scholar who less than a year earlier found American pragmatism an offense to German precision. So back to the question posed at the outset, what happened? In America of the year 1930-31, among a lost but venerable generation of radical Christians, social gospel reformers, and African American preachers, among many of the same women and men who plowed the soil for the civil rights movement to come, Bonhoeffer learned the skills and practices that helped him do theology closer to the ground and that enabled the turning from the phraseological to the real. One last point. Bart Bonhoeffer's favorite book was a little book. It's a powerful book. When, I, when people ask me, what are the, not that people ask me this often, but what are the two most important books you've ever read? I say, as a theologian, it would be James Cone's Black Theology, Black Power, and it would be Karl Barth's Word of God, Word of Man that's translated, and the new translation, Word of God and the Task of Theology. Well, this was Bonhoeffer's favorite book at the time, and in this extraordinary book, um, Barth ponders the possibility of, of ever hearing God's word afresh and anew after the era of religion had passed, of hearing amid the din and clutter of modernity and the babble of um, religious language um, that, um, um, that, um, that has killed the idea of God by a, a, a thousand equivocations, of hearing for the first time the eternal word. How do you do that? How do you hear a fresh word of God? <laughs> How do you hear the word of God spoken with authenticity and surprise and delight? Bart said that a century of hopes for enlightened self-expansion lay in ruins. The world had turned with disquiet disorder and distress in forms minute and gross, obscure and evident. Those keeping the faith, Bonhoeffer said, you know, those wanting to keep the language of faith alive, often you know, take refuge in eternally green islands of security. Security he would call religious institutions or, or morality or the nation. Pitching their tents in these lands of self-righteousness, of, of human-made morality and religion and nationalism. But true Christianity was always elsewhere to be found. It was always strange and unfamiliar. And Bart said, we must take the trouble to go off far enough to hear the word again. We must take the trouble to travel to new places. Well, Bonhoeffer now knew himself able to go that distance because, as he said at the end of this year, 
I heard the gospel preached for the first time in the Negro churches of America. So thanks for bearing with me.